start. Let's see. Good. We have balance now. That's very cool. All right. Well, I'll give a few more microseconds here. That clock is off. No, it's really not. It's perfect. It's very confusing when it's reading the right time. <laughs>
here comes his father, and he's got this problem of this, this son. And, it, and, it, and, and just that whole sequence of everything, it just shows that the God in his greatness, he doesn't isolate himself from these problems. He doesn't insulate himself. You know, it, 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 because the Bible says in, in 1 John 3, 5, he uses this wonderful word, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. That's a great word. Manifested. In the Greek, it means to make to appear, disclose. And this is, this is Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He is manifested that he is God. In God himself. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the fact that Christ is God was disclosed. It was seen. And right after this, this disclosure comes this distraught father. And, 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 and it shows that Christ was shown to be God to take away our sins. To cure us from our sins. And we might have expected that, 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 uh, that maybe as he's coming down the mountain, he's just been shown to be God, that the disciples would have said, Oh, you know who this, you know this is? God. Out of the way. Out of his way. Get out of his way. He can't be bothered with these personal problems here. He's God. God just, just he, 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 and, and, and this is not what happened. This is not what happened. Jesus is a man revealed to be God, he comes down from the mountain, and he stops to help this, this, this son, this father, this son. It's an amazing part of the sequence of all of this. And, and, and it's very interesting that in the next statement, what it says about this father, it says in verse 14, there came to him a certain man kneeling down down to him. Now, nobody else is kneeling down to him. This is a certain man, and it just shows how certain this man is, how unusual this man is, a certain man. It means that this man has stood out from the crowd. This man is different from all the rest of the crowd. He's unique because then what makes this man a certain man from everyone else is the fact that what it says about him in verse 4, he's kneeling down. No, he's the only one kneeling there. He steps out from all the rest of the crowd there. I mean, I was going to say, you know, the Jewish crowd, but that's stupid because everybody's Jewish in this verse, <laughs> in this setting here. But he nevertheless, he steps out and he kneels down in front of Jesus. No one else is kneeling down. And that makes him unique. So why, among all the people do we, who are, by the way, are referred to in verse 14 as the multitude, big crowd, the multitude. So why is this one man different from all the multitude? Why is he the one who comes out and kneels down? What is it that, 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 that from this big crowd makes this man so different to kneel down in front of Jesus? Well, obviously it's because... He's so distressed. His son is, is destroying himself. He's watching this. And, 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 and so this answers the question, why is it, you know, why is this man different from all other men? Why is it that this man, among all the great multitude of people who hear about Jesus, but he's the only one certain person who comes to Jesus in this form of worshiping and kneeling to him? Because the, the level of distress was so great in this, in this father, it drove him down. His level was so great, the level of distress and trouble was so great, that it drove him down to his knees to get before Jesus. And if a person is going to come worshiping and kneeling before Jesus, it's because the level of distress is so great that it drives him to that. That's not to say that everyone who was so greatly distressed would, was going to become worshiping and kneeling for Jesus. But if a person does, it will be because of this father, his problems have become so great, it drives him down. And this man now opens up his heart. He's driven down to his knees, and now he's opening up his heart to Christ in verse 15, when he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. And he explains he's a lunatic, he's sore vexed, and oftentimes he's been going into the fire and into the water. And, and, and the Father comes with these words. And his prayer to Christ is really the prayer that reveals the heart of a good father. He's the heart of a good father. He says in verse 15, Lord, 
have mercy on my son. Those words come from the heart of a, 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 a real father who says, Lord, have mercy on my son. Those words come from the heart of any father for his son. When his son cannot pray for himself, as was the case here, Lord, have mercy on my son. For those words come from the heart of a father uh, 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 for, for his son when his son will not pray for himself, as was the case here also. Lord, have mercy on my son. And there's something that just happens to a father. There's something that happens to a father when he comes to God in prayer, and he doesn't, he's not using his son's name. He's not saying, you know, have mercy on Sammy, have mercy on Billy. But he prays to God and he says, have mercy on my son. When a father calls his boy, my son, he's getting close to saying, what he's really kind of saying there is, Lord, this is my son. This is, this is not just any kid. This is my son. This is just not any man. This is my son. The son you gave to me. He's sick. He's sick. Just like the, 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 the just like that, that mother that did for her son in the, in the, in the account about Elijah when, the, when the, her son died and she came. Lord, this is my son, the son that I will never let go of. No matter how far away he gets from God, no matter how separate, I'll never let go. I'll care for him till till my dying day, just like Job did when Job prayed for his sons before they did die because he thought maybe they cursed God in their hearts. He, that's, a, that's a father. <laughs> Lord, this is my son. This is, a, this is a part of me. This is the one I've invested in, just like David did for Solomon when he prayed in 1 Chronicles 29, 18. 1 Chronicles 29, 18, and he said, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, David said, keep this ever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee and give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy, 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 thy commandments. See this phrase, my son, my son, this is what really characterized the relationship between Abraham and Isaac. It was this, my son. This is what comes out so loud and clear in Genesis 22, and especially on that little walk that they took together up Mount Moriah. And then Genesis 22, 7. Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, and where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. I mean, when it comes to investing in a son, really putting your heart into a son, there's one book in the Bible, there's one book in the Bible that has the words, my son, more than any other book in the Bible except for Genesis. And that book is, do you know what that book is? Anybody got an idea? What? John. It's a book of Proverbs. Proverbs. You're surprised, aren't you? It's a book of Proverbs because if you want to really understand the book of Proverbs, then you've got to look at it as the words of a father and a mother to their son. That's what the book of Proverbs is all about. The book of Proverbs is a book of the heart of a father and of a mother towards the son. And that's why you've got these verses in the book of Proverbs. Right off the bat, Proverbs 1.8, Proverbs 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 1.10, again, first chapter, verse 10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Proverbs 5.20, And will, why wilt thou, this is getting very personal, but they're telling him, Why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Proverbs 6.20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, forsake not the law of thy mother. And then, the mother really is, 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 is talking to the son when she says in Proverbs 31, toward the end, Proverbs 31.2, Proverbs 31.2, What the son of my, what, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now, 
the father now, he comes to Christ and he explains his dilemma. He says, he says, my son's a lunatic. He's sore vexed. He's falling in the water. He's falling in the fire. And as he's describing this, it's very clear to everybody that the devil has one goal and one purpose. And it is 1 Peter 5.8, 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who he may devour. See, that's it. Devour. Catapino. Devour means to drink down, to swallow, to destroy. It's a picture of the grave. The grave says, ah, it's never, uh, never enough, never enough, never enough. The grave is a big, giant mouth. The Bible says in Proverbs 112, Proverbs 112, let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. I'm always amazed to watch pelicans. Pelicans are one of my favorite animals, but I love to watch a pelican when it just comes in there and it'll grab a sardine or a mackerel hole and boom, down it goes and it's wiggling in its stomach and you can see that from the outside. That's amazing. It doesn't chew it or kill it or anything, you know. It just swallows in that big, huge... Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there was a battle raging between Christ and the devil and death on the cross. And just when death was about to do that pelican move, on Christ, swallow him up. Just about that. That was the time when Christ turned and swallowed up death on the cross, and that's Isaiah 25 8. Isaiah 25 8. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. The Lord has spoken it. And it's interesting. The devil has this goal. He wants to kill, destroy. He wants to devour, swallow up. So, you know, when anybody ever tells me that um, I hear voices, I hear voices, I always say, don't tell me. I know what the voices are saying to you. I know what they are. They're saying, kill yourself. And oftentimes people say, how'd you know that? Oh, it would be so thrilling. Wow, wouldn't that be so? You never know that. I'd be kill yourself. Because that's the goal of the devil. John 10.10, 10, John 10.10, 10. the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. I am come, Christ said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundant. You ever stood on a balcony of a high building or a roof? You ever had that sort of urge, like, jump? <laughs> Jesus that his son was sore vexed and there's actually more details about this account in the book of Mark in the book of Mark in Mark 9 17 and one of the multitude answered and said master I have brought unto thee my son which hath the dumb spirit and whatsoever he teareth them he teareth them and foameth and gnasheth with his teeth pineth away and I spake to the disciples and they should cast them out and they could not he answereth and said, O faithless in generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes hath cast him into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. 
And the spirit and cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So the Father tells the Lord, uh, 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 tells the Lord uh, 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 how he feels so helpless. He just sits there and watches his son go into an epileptic fit. And if you've ever been around a person who has gone into a grand mal epileptic fit, epileptic attack, you know how helpless you feel. You can't, maybe you get a towel, stick it in his mouth so he doesn't bite his tongue off, that's about it. You can do nothing to get that person out, you just have to wait it out. And the father describes his son foaming at the mouth and grinding his teeth down throwing himself into a fire and getting burned in water. And they try to rescue him from drowning. And, 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 and they say he's shriveling up. All of this is causing all of him to shrivel up, pining away to nothing. And, and the father feels absolutely helpless. He's so desperate. And he further explains to the Lord. He, 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 he in, in Luke, there's another passage about this. In Luke 9.38, Luke 9.38, behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is my only child, and lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, that he foameth again, and bruising him, hardly departeth from him, barely leaves him. This is the father's only child. So the father, kind of like Abraham with his only son, with Sarah, Isaac, and when God described Abraham's son to him. When God described Abraham's love for his only son Isaac, he used words in Genesis 22, 1. Genesis 22, 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Behold, I, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, comma, thine only son, Isaac, comma, whom thou lovest and get to the end of the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering. So when God told Abraham, he called Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, God told Abraham that, in essence, God said to Abraham, Abraham, I understand how Isaac is your only son. Abraham, I understand how all of your love is focused on this one, on, on this one, on Isaac. I know that. He says, take now thy son, Genesis 22, 2. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, who thou love this. Well, this is his father with this son. This is his only son. It's his only child. And he loves him, and he feels all the pain when his son goes through these epileptic fits and, and destroys himself. And, he's, and, 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 it's, and, and, he, and the father, he, he doesn't say help my son. The father didn't use the word him when he asked for help. The father used the word us. And that's so important. He says in Mark 9.22, Mark 9.22, have compassion on us and help us. He says, he doesn't say have compassion on him. Of course, he wanted to have compassion on him. He's just, but him is just the son. He's just part of the whole gang there. It's the father and the mother and Whoever else, he says, have compassion on us and help us. And when the Lord told the father that he needed to believe that the Lord had compassion and that he's going to heal his son, he needed to have faith. He needed to believe that, 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 he, he, that Christ had the passion, the compassion for his son. He needed to believe that Christ had the will to heal his son. He needed to believe that Christ had the power. He had to believe these three things. He had the compassion, he had the will, he had the power. This is essence what he said, you know, if you can believe. And the father didn't argue with him, say, no, 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 I do, I do, I do. He didn't do that. The father accepted the fact that he was a, he was a spiritual cripple. He accepted the fact that he was in a state of unbelief. He didn't have the sufficient belief in the power and the passion and, and, and the person of Christ. He didn't have that. And he cries out to Jesus to help him. 
because the father accepted from the Lord that he needed help as much as the son needed help when he replied in, in Mark 9.24, Mark 9.24, straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. That's one of the greatest prayers of honesty. It's just being just totally bare, naked, honest in, in the Bible of a man who accepted from the Lord this rebuke for not believing in the compassion, the will, and the power of Jesus to rescue this, 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 this desperate son. And then, and then the, 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 the father then tells Christ of this great disappointment that he had. He said, I am so disappointed because I expected that when I brought my son to your disciples, in, in uh, verse 16, verse 16, I brought him to thy disciples and they could not heal him. Cure him. They could not cure him. You can just feel this father. He says, I'm just at the end. What more can I do? I mean, what happened here? So what happened was that while Peter and John and James, they were on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration with the Lord, Elijah, and, and Moses, so the father then brings his son to the remaining nine disciples uh, down below, and, and they couldn't cure him. Now, this is really quite a scene. This is quite a scene. Because the Lord, at this particular time now, the Lord was on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and, and the Father had brought his only son to the nine disciples below. And the nine disciples, they had been given power, and that was no secret. They had been given power over unclean spirits like this one, that the Lord told them in, in Matthew 10, 1, Matthew 10, 1, when he had called unto them, unto him, when he called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So what happened? And then in Matthew 10, 7, now in Matthew 10, 7, he told them, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, Raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you receive, freely give. What happened? The father is saying, What happened? And the disciples had been successful in their mission, and they were casting out devils, and they came back and told them about it in, in Luke 10 17. Luke 10 17, the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. But now the father says that the nine disciples failed. Bold faced failed, could not. In verse 16, verse 16, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And you can just see him saying, It's your disciples that I brought him to. And to make matters worse, the scribes were hanging around with all of this, and they got involved in Mark 9:14, Mark 9:14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them. These are the nine. And the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and wanting to him and saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered, said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh them, he teareth them, and foameth them, gnashes with his teeth, pineth away. And I spake to the disciples they could, that they should cast him out, and they could not. So, the father brings to the nine disciples here his troubled son for them to cast out this devil, and the nine disciples fail, period, to cast him out. And then move in the scribes who've been hanging around the fringes, and they begin to question the disciples about, well, well how come you couldn't cast out this one, huh, buddy boy? Why couldn't you cast him out? And you can just imagine the questions that are coming from these scribes. Well, boys, maybe your master, your master said that all power was given unto him, and you got a special power to cast out devils. Well, here you are with the devil. You can't cast him out. You can't do it. You failed. What does that tell us? What does that tell you? Does your master really have all that power given to him? I mean, you could not cast out this devil. Does your master really have the ability to give you that power that he says he has? You just failed to cast out this devil. You sure? You sure you're following the right rabbi? Maybe not. 
Don't you want to reconsider your decision that you've made to follow Jesus? Isn't it really time for you boys to give up this Jesus stuff and come back to the synagogue where you belong? Isn't it? That's how the scribes were questioning the disciples, and the Lord saw these scribes in their critical mode, and so he comes in, in Mark 9, 16, Mark 9, 16, and he, and he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And the scribes don't answer. They don't answer. They don't have to answer because they've done their work of injecting the venomous thoughts of doubt into the minds of the nine disciples, just like the serpent did when he injected his venomous doubts into the mind of Eve, and then he slithers away. In Genesis 3, 4, Genesis 3, 4, the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And the serpent and the scribes did not have to answer, because they knew, they, the serpent and the scribes knew that the, the power of the venom of doubt that they had injected into their prey, that it would do its work of destroying faith after they left the scene. So when the Lord came to the disciples and asked them, you know, uh, I'm sorry, when the Lord came to the scribes and asked them what they were what they were questioning his disciples about, they don't say a word. But the father of the boy speaks up in Mark 9.16, Mark 9.16. He asked the scribes what question he with them, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. So this sets the scene here of of the of the, of this this uh, this uh, faithless questioning uh, scribes. See, they were the faithless questioning scribes. They were here was the half believing desperate father, and here is the demon possessed son, and here is really the discouraged nine disciples. That's what you got here. You got a scene like that's your scene. So to the faithless questioning scribes. The Lord says in verse 17, verse 17, Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? To the half-believing, desperate father, the Lord says in Mark 9, 23, Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. To this demon-possessed son, the Lord says in Mark 9.25, we're really the demon to the demon who was possessing the son. He says in Mark 9.25, when Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more. And then finally to the discouraged nine disciples, to the discouraged nine disciples, he turns to them and says in Mark 9.29, Mark 9.29, he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. You see what he did here? There's four different parties here, and he's turning from one to the other to the other, and he's giving them the word that was right for them. Now the Lord asked these questions in verse 17. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. So, he looks at the, the, the scribes, like we said, and he calls them a faithless and perverse generation. True faith, true faith centers on Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. Faith is, it's just like the hymn puts it, really, you can't put it any better than this. My faith has found a resting place. It's not in device, it's not in creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds shall, wounds, wounds shall plead for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. See, that phrase, my faith has found a resting place. It paints a picture of the dove that was searching for a nest to rest in when Noah let it loose out of the ark. In Genesis 8, 8, Genesis 8, 8. And Noah sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into the, in unto him into the ark. 
And he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent the dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. See, that dove is a picture of our souls. We're like that dove. At first, we go into the world and we look for a nest to rest our souls in. And our experience is frustration. And we return. We didn't find any rest for our souls in the world. Just like the dove, our experience is like the hymn. Another hymn. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame. And nothing satisfying there I found. The dove returned. And then we saw Christ. Then we saw him the first time. And we were interested. But we didn't actually put our faith and trust in him at first. Just like the dove who returned back a second time. And she was interested. She had this little little olive uh, branch in her mouth there and, and, and carried it back to Noah. And then it happened, like the hymn says, the hymn goes on to say, I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross I came, cross of Christ I came, one day I came, where springs of living water did abound, drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I. My soul they satisfy, drinking at the springs of living water. Wonderful, bountiful supply. See, that was the happy day. That was the happy day when Jesus washed all our sins away, and we put our complete faith and trust in him. That's when our faith found a resting place. Just like the dove who didn't return anymore to Noah because she found a resting place. She found a nest. That's Christ is the nest for our souls. Now, so he says faithless generation. So then he says perverse generation. Perverse just means going the wrong way. It's like reverse, you know, perverse, going the wrong way. Going the wrong way. So when Jesus looks at the scribes, he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, he's calling them faithless, faithless because they had no reliance on Christ. They had, they, he was not their, the nest for their souls because they didn't believe that he was God and they didn't believe that he was wanting to help. He had compassion and they didn't believe that he could help. So he calls them faithless. He calls them perverse because he's saying you're going the wrong way. You just go on the wrong way. Romans 10.3, Romans 10.3 describes the way they were going. Romans 10.3 says, They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. It's a very, very good uh, description of perverse going the wrong way when it says going about to establish their own relationship. And it means they really are going about keeping all the Sabbath laws that are written in the Bible, and then some, and going about with the kosher laws, and going about with many other laws and rules and regulations, all designed to establish their own relationship, going about to establish their own righteousness, I mean to say. Going about to establish their own righteousness. That's the wrong way. That's, that's the perverse way. Because a sinner needs salvation through faith, not an establishment of a self-righteousness through works. And then in total frustration with the scribes, the Lord asks the question in verse 17, How long am I going to be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And by asking those questions, how long shall I be with you? The Lord is, is, is asking, how long? that he should be with them because the scribes were showing no evidence at all and starting to respond to Christ, and starting to come to Christ. And so he's asking, how long am I going to suffer you? He's asking how long he should tolerate their opposition, their venomous uh, questions of doubt to everything he's doing, left and right. So in verse 17, the Lord asks these two questions. He says, how long, how long? And as a matter of fact, there's really a third question that's, that hasn't been spoken, but he's been, been, well, it hasn't spoken. He, he actually, like I said, it's in Mark 9. Mark 9, 19, he asked this third question, how long, question the Father, Mark 9, 19. He answered him, 
Mark 9, 19. And saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? They brought unto him him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit chair him. He fell on the ground, wallowing, foaming. And he asked his father, How long has it been? How long ago is it ago since this time? How long is it ago since this came unto him? In other words, how long has this been going on? And he said, I'm a child. So the third question, the third how long question was, how long has the boy been in this state? How long has this been going on? His father, I don't say it's a boy. How long has his son been, been in this state? And the father responds, a very long time since he was a child. Let's just call it for all his life. So these threes, how long questions are very searching because they're designed to cause people to stop and think about it. How long? I mean, two of the Lord's question, how long questions were focused on the, the, really the future, how long shall I, how long shall I? And one of them, how long, to the Father, it, it's focused on the past. So, so he's got two questions, how long for the future, he's got one question, how long for the past. Kind of like looking at a gas gauge on your car, a gas tank meter. You know, when you, you, you look at that gas tank meter, what do you do? You, you see the needle, you look above, you look below the needle, right? <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 you look you look below and you see how much gas you got left for the future. And you look above and you see how much gas you used already. That's what you do. So his first how long question was for the future. And it's really a question of how much time's left? How much time's left? Where, where he asked the, 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 those scribes, those scribes are lost, 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 lost. And he asked those lost scribes, he, like, like he asked every person, how much more time do you think you have that, that, that I'll be here with you and you'll have an opportunity to come to me, to, to accept my invitation and, and, and become my child of God? So with that question, the Lord is saying that, you know what? There's a bottom of this gas gauge, of this gas tank meter got a big E on it at the bottom. It means empty, as in no more, as in not of us, as in when it's gone, it's gone. And that's true in life. It's not, it's not a gas tank gauge, gas tank meter. It's the days of our life meter. It's the days of life meter. And above that days of life meter, that needle, is the number of days that life has been lived. And below that days of life meter needle there is the number of days left for life to live. And that's what the days of life meter is all about. It shows how many days of life has been used up and how many days are, are left on, on earth. The only thing is not, it's not calibrated. We don't get numbers. You just see the needles. And at the bottom of the, that days of life meter, there's not an E. There's a big D. It stands for die. And the Bible is referring to that days of life meter in, in, in Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27, what it says, it's appointed unto men once to die, bedee, and after this the judgment. And, and, and can you imagine a person who gets into a car and just drives that car and never looks at the gas gauge? You know, and, he, and then all of a sudden, the, you know, the car stopped, he's surprised, and he says, what happened? You know. And then he looks at the gas gauge and he, and he sees the, the needle's on E. It's on empty. And he'd say, and then he said, oh, I should have been looking at the gas gauge. Right? Because when you're focused on the gas tank meter, you, you, you think of where you want to go with that limited amount of gas right, in the tank. And you don't drive around in circles and then try to figure it out. Because you've got a limited amount of gas in the tank. And so a driver... He gets taught from the beginning. He says, you keep your eye on that gas tank meter because you're going as far as that gas is. And in the same way, the Bible says we need for God to teach us to keep our eye on the days of life meter in, in Psalm 90, verse 12. Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And this is what the two questions of the Lord is all about when he asks the scribes in verse 17, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And with these two questions, the Lord is teaching the scribes, look at the days of life meter. 
and see how long you have an opportunity to come to Christ and be saved from your sins. And see how, mu how, how, how much time you have left. And in those two questions, Christ is asking, really, he's asking, why? Why? Why have you not come to Christ to be saved from your sins? What are you waiting for? Asked Jehovah Jesus in Ezekiel 18.31. Ezekiel 18.31. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. Why will ye die, O house of Israel? And then in Ezekiel 33.11, Ezekiel 33.11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? O house of Israel, dying without Christ, being cast into hell to suffer for eternity is 100% totally unnecessary because God has done something that it doesn't have to be. Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. God said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. It is so unnecessary for a person to, to die without Christ to be thrown into hell. It's so unnecessary. So the question comes with this how long and why is, why not come to Christ? How long are you going to not come to Christ? Just like Elijah asked Israel in 1 Kings 18.21, 1 Kings 18.21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long, Paul G, between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. That's the worst answer that a person can give. The people answered him not a word. That's the worst answer a person can give to the question, how long before you accept Christ? And the worst answer is, not yet. That's the worst because it's the worst answer for a person to give to the question, why not come to Christ now? And the worst answer is, not yet. And the Lord asked the father of this demon-possessed boy, he said, how long is it since, since this came unto him? He said, of a child. And the Lord looked at the boy and then asked the, he, he, and he asked the father, he said, how long, has this boy, how long has this boy been in the state of this man or wherever he is? It's really a question, how long has all this been suffering been going on? How long have you been doing this? Uh, how long? A believer starts on his life in Christ, and he's got the bloom of his first love. He's really in love with Christ, and the Bible is, oh, the Bible is like alive. That's a hot book, you know? And prayer is, oh, it's so fervent, and it's purposeful, and it's intention. You listen to him pray, and you, you think that God is standing right in front of him, and, he laid it all out there, and answers to prayer. He's on a search every day. He's looking for these answers to these prayers. And when he finds them, he's so exhilarated with the answer. And Sunday, oh, Sunday, that's the best day of the week. That's church. You know, that's the way it starts out. But then it's, uh, you know, I'm a little too busy to read the Bible today. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, prayer. I I'll pray later, just not right now. Sunday again? Do I have to go to church? And then those days in that state, they morph into weeks. And those weeks morph into months. And those months morph into years. And the Lord asks the same question. How long? How long since you left your first love? Just like the hymn says, the old hymn, old song. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and you told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew he cared for you? See, so that's all these how long questions. Well. At this point, uh, everything has failed for the father. Um, his son is just is, 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 has not gotten better on his own. He hasn't grown out of it. 
uh, the disciples have not been able to cure his son. He's in a real state of depression and desperation when he comes and kneels down before Jesus. And now he gets this one simple instruction in verse 17. And it's, it's like, that's it. And it's, bring him hither to me. That's it. It's the same thing, Mark. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. It's just so simple. Just bring the boy to you. Bring the, the, the son to you. This demon possessed son. Bring him to Jesus. Bring him to Christ. It's the one simple solution that, 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 that was the remedy. It's the one simple solution in our lives. Just bring to Jesus. And it was all so quickly over. It's amazing. So long, but verse 17, Jesus rebuked the devil and he would depart out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. A lifetime of misery, a lifetime of agony is over just like that. Just from bringing him to Jesus. So quick. It made the Lord's questions all the more penetrating, you know, Mark 9 21. Mark, Mark 9 21. Mark 9 21. He asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. And then Matthew 17, 18, Matthew 17, 18, Jesus rebukes the devil. He departs out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. How long did the, the child suffer? Mark 9, 21, of a child, a lifetime. How long did it take to cure him? Matthew 17, 18, from that very hour. And we can hear the father say to himself, why did I wait so long? Why did I wait so long before coming to Jesus? I've heard of him. Been around. And that same question, a saved person asks himself, why did I wait so long before coming to Jesus? Okay, now, the son is cured. The healing is complete. It's over. A lifetime of agony is in the past, in the history. Jesus has delivered this son, and the father is relieved. And now it's Mark's account that really tells us something very interesting. A little note. Mark 9.25. Mark 9.25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. He entered no more. The spirit cried, rent him sore, came out of him. And he was as one dead in so much that many said he is dead. And here's the little note. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. That little note says so much. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. That little detail shows us how this healing was not a cold, sterile, okay, next, you know, job's finished, let's move on. It wasn't that way for the Lord. The Lord, he didn't have to do this. He didn't have to touch the son. He didn't have to take him by the hand. He didn't have to raise him up, but he did and the fact that he did shows that how personally the Lord was involved. How much the Lord was involved in this. This was a very emotional time for the Lord. When the Lord saw, it, 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 and, and, I mean, the Lord, he was deeply moved by all this scene. Mark 9, 20, Mark 9, 20, when he saw the, the tearing of him and the falling on the ground and the wallowing and the foaming, the mouth, he was pained at the sight of this destruction. Just like the Lord is, was pained at the sight of how we had destroyed our lives by sin. And the Lord had compassion on this son. The Lord had compassion on the daughter, daughter father. And, and when the Lord fully entered into this pain, he, is when he said, how long has this been going on? So that he could feel the pain of how long it's happened. And at last he heals the son. At last he 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 he, he has cast out the devil. And the reason the Lord took this son by the hand and lifted him up is because he wanted to show by this act how much he loved that son and how much he loved that father and how much he delighted to be able to present what was ruined as now repaired. You know, kind of like if somebody brought you, brought you a broken vase or something like that, and you got your super glue out, and you glued it all there, and then you said, hey, you go, you would give that up. You wouldn't give that up for anything. That's going to be your, 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 your reward. How much the Lord delighted in redeeming, in restoring, and in rescuing 
And this is what he came to do, and that's why his last word before he died on the cross was accomplished. Asa, finished. There. Did what I came to do. Done. And when the Lord took that, that son by the hand and lifted him up, presented him to the, the, the son of the father, it was all a grand. Here he is. Health restored. And that's the picture we have of Christ. When he does the same thing for each one of his children as he brings them up out of the grave into heaven. Up from death to life to the skies. Because that's just who Christ is. Now, this leaves the disciples with this question, and they don't know. So they asked him in verse 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because you were unbelief. Verily I say unto you, if you have faith as great and much, you can see you say this mountain, it's by the point of the Mount of Transfiguration. Mountain, remain stands the yonder place, it'll remove, nothing shall be impossible unto you, how by it? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So the reason is, he says, the reason you couldn't do it is because you've got the same disease the Father does, unbelief. Because of your unbelief, says in verse 20. In other words, this is a challenge of faith. It was a challenge of faith for the Father. It's a challenge of faith for you boys as well. It's a challenge of confidence. The challenge for the disciples is, and for the, the Father, just how much do you really believe that Jesus is God? Just how much do you really believe that Jesus is the Lord over the devil and all the demons, including this one? Just how much do you believe that Jesus really wants to see people saved from demons? Just how much do you believe that, that, that <clears throat> Jesus uh, it was giving uh, power over the demons? But nevertheless, even though so, all of that, the Lord spoke about this demon as being a certain kind of demon, which was more difficult to cast out. And this kind of demon, he said, can be, can be, uh, be cast out by nothing except prayer and fasting. Verse 21, verse 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. This kind, he's saying, it takes a more intensive prayer. This kind takes fasting. <clears throat> well, what is it about fasting? Fasting weakens the body. Take it from me. I never fast, and you can see that. It weakens the body. It makes a person less reliant on self and more reliant on God. That's what fasting does. Now, we don't know about all the different kinds of demons and what he's talking about, and we don't need to. All we need to know is that whatever kind of demon this was and whatever kind of problem we may have, the remedy is always the same. And it's verse 17. Verse 17. Bring him hither to me. Let me do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for... Our Lord Jesus, thank you for sending him. Thank you we get to see him, be thrilled by him. Help us to, to uh, take away messages from this passage in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.